would now like to introduce our next speaker, uh, where we will have a different generation, uh, and I think also a uh, different format of, of lecture that I think should fit in quite well for the afternoon. Uh, I'm also very honored to meet uh, this person, uh, Miss Melody Hosseini. Uh, many of you may have heard of her, those of you who are based in the UK uh, from uh, various TV appearances and beyond, uh, but she's really, I think, a great example of a young leader in the best sense of the word, uh, and an entrepreneur. She has her LLB uh, with honors uh, law degree from Oxford Brooks. Uh, in her recent career, uh, but I guess you could even say uh, also beyond that, she's reached over a million young people in about 100 countries. She's one of the leading youth sector figures in the United Kingdom with an equally strong profile globally. When she was 13 years old, she helped to establish a leading democratic youth organization, and in 2005 made history becoming the first female and ethnic minority to be elected chair of its board of trustees. With 13 years experience in the youth sector, Melody became founder and director of Inspire Engage International in 2009, with an end objective of improving the lives of children and young people. Inspire Engage's uh, innovative services, developed and delivered by Melody, are the first of its kind in several parts of the world. Her work is fueled by the inspiring young people she meets. Melody has worked and been trained by Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu, former Vice President Al Gore, and United Nations dignitaries. Last year, her work with the Commonwealth Heads of Government even featured on the Queen's Christmas Day speech. The title of her presentation is How to Change the World. If you could please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Miss Melody Hosseini. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. What I'm going to speak to you today about is a little bit about Inspire Engage International um, and what we do. Um, but that was a wonderful introduction, really, about, about what we do. So hopefully that should give you a picture. And then from there, I want to talk about how you can change the world. Because um, it is very important. You're all, I was looking at the participant list, you're all incredibly um, talented and, and knowledgeable around different areas, and particularly from different countries. So that's really fantastic that we've got all that within the room. Um, but I think that actually when it comes to changing the world, whether it's for corruption, whether it's for whatever it is that you want to do, um, it's about individuals. So what Inspiring Age International is very concerned with is about building and empowering people to be able to achieve change, whatever role that they're in. So that's hopefully, oh, hurrah, it's white. Okay, so hopefully that should be fixed in a moment. So does that sound okay? And then we can take some questions at the end as well, so it, we can have a bit of a dialogue. Lovely. Is that, is that going to be a, all right, do you think? So um, just a snapshot of Inspire Engage International. This is sort of what we do. Um, we are a social enterprise, which I, I hit my head against a brick wall explaining on The Apprentice what a social enterprise is to a very corporate environment. But a social enterprise basically is when you combine a good cause with a robust business model. So we measure social capital as well as profits. Um, so Inspire Engage International, the, the good cause, as it were, is supporting the lives of children and young people. And we do that through a, an array of di different sorts of ways that we do that, which I'll mention in a moment. We have a profile in over 100 different countries, a lot of the countries which are listed and represented here today. And um, we've been honored to have reached over a million young people worldwide. So Dr. Eric Chivion, who's an incredible man who we had the honor of working with in Canada, um, who is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, described Inspiring Age International as um, Inspiring Age International is training young people how best to tackle the leading social justice and culturally dividing challenges of our time. So how do you do that, Melody, I hear you ask? Well, one of the main sorts of ways that we do that, the core sort of service that we deliver, is skills development training. You can throw all the opportunities in the world at people. You can raise their knowledge. You can make them feel inspired. You can even throw funding in if you're lucky. But if people don't have the necessary, particularly young people, but also professionals, young professionals, if they don't have the necessary skills to be able to make the most of those opportunities, then it can be futile. So these are the different sort of ways in which we work with um, young people, particularly inspiring age skills boot camps where we get straight down to business. And we cover areas such as leadership skills because it is about leadership. If you're mobilizing people, you want them to believe in your cause. It, is, it takes leadership skills. 
And then you, we cover communication skills, and that's speaking, listening, and body language. You're communicating something to me right now by the way you're sitting and looking and so forth. And then project management and business development. So how is it that you can really bring your vision to light in a very, very practical way, you know? So it's not about talking about it, but it's about walking out of that room with a strategy in your hand. And then something that I'm very interested in as well, um, and, and why I'm particularly passionate about being here today, um, we do a lot of cultural learning, cultural exchange. Um, I myself personally was born in Iran. Iran, the Persian Empire that helped create human rights, and then now we don't enjoy the, that ourselves. You know, um, if I stood speaking like this in a microphone, I'd probably I don't even want to say what would happen, uh, who knows, but, um, but yeah, so, so we fled as asylum seekers and immigrants to Sweden, where Sweden is a very, very incredible country with wonderful social services and rights, and then I've lived in the UK now for 14 years, so I have a particular interest um, in differences, in cultures, in exchange of thoughts and learning, and I would also, just on that, would advise you that have conversations with each other. You know, how do you do things in your country and, and exchange ideas? Because it's a wonderful opportunity. We're driven by need. If you remembered in August on the news, you must have seen the riots that happened in London, very sadly. Obviously, we've got people here from, from, the, from this country. Um, well, a few days after the riots, I went to a conference called Not In Our Name. And basically, that was about young people saying, that's a minority. Yeah, that's not everybody. Not everybody likes to go into Tesco's and steal rice and take a picture with it. You know, that's not the majority of people who want to do that. So I went along to this conference and three young people spoke. One of those young people stood up and spoke. She's 17 years old. She said, look, I grew up in Peckham. I'm not even going to lie. Like, I was tempted to take part in the riots. Um, you know, I come home, you think that, you know, we're all on, like, benefits and stuff. The benefits doesn't even go far enough to feed my sister, my brother, my other sister and my mother. Um, so, you know, but one day I went to a youth meeting, youth conference, and I got a glimpse of a different life. And I want to choose another path. So I went up to her afterwards. You know, some people just have a presence, you know, when they speak. They just, you know, you just see potential. So I went up to her and said, look... Next week, we're holding an Inspiring Edge Skills Boot Camp, okay? Here's a ticket, bring a friend, come, with, come. You know, I'd love to see you there. She was like, yeah, 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 you know, thanks, Melody, da, da, da. And I thought, oh, is she gonna come? Is she not gonna come? Who knows? Anyway, she came, right? She came. And at first, she was like leaning back in her chair, so not even taking her coat off, thinking, is this gonna be worth my time or is this another one of those things? Should I slip out at lunchtime? Our skills development training is not lecture-based. It is so interactive. I mean, even this, this section that I'm doing for you guys is going to be interactive. So it, we don't believe in, like, you know, because you need that interaction because it's very personal skills, you know? It's personal. Everybody in this room will have different strengths and weaknesses. So she got involved. She was like, doing it. It's about her vision, what you want to do, everything. Anyway, she stayed till the end. This is her. And I'm big on Twitter. Tweet me. Find me on Twitter, okay? She tweeted me saying, I just left Inspiring Age Skills Seminar. I loved it. I'm feeling inspired to make my life work. And that's what it's about. That is what we do. That's what it's about. It's about getting young people who have potential. They just need a little bit of opportunity, a little bit of support, a little bit of a platform to develop their skills, to be the best that they can be. Um, and that's very difficult. If you're in a social entrepreneur, you do simil similar things, sorry. It's very difficult to describe that in one sentence. You know, you're not, you don't produce products. You're, you know, people aren't numbers. So, so that's often my challenge, is to describe and bottle th what we do into a very tangible format. So I won't share this with you because I'm conscious of time, but there is an inspiring age story. There's a way in which um, I established a company, um, how we came to be what we are today, how we got our first contract. Very, very interesting. If you're a social entrepreneur, um, I'd love to share that with you one day. If, if you're particularly interested, you can ask me in the Q&A. Um, so The Apprentice. Um, who here has heard of The Apprentice? You have, right? A few people. So The Apprentice was an incredible experience. It's a very corporate environment. It's a competition. A lot of my colleagues were surprised to see me on there because obviously we're, we're social entrepreneurs. But I wanted to bring something new to the table. And I was actually the first ever social entrepreneur on The Apprentice. Um, but very, very interesting experience. Um, and I think that a lot of uh, Mr. Eigen's points about corporates and businesses and things like that were very interesting in terms of my learning taking part in that. 
Okay, so that's a snapshot of, of, of me and what we do, I mean, in a, in a, in a very small nutshell. Um, I'm just trying to think whether I've... Okay, you, you can ask me more questions if you need to know. But what I'm interested in doing now is talking to you about how you can change the world. So you might be sitting here, you might be a lawyer, okay? You, you've got that remit, you've got that power, you know, you're a lawyer, you've got that knowledge. You might be sitting here and you're a lecturer or a professor or something at a university, you know, so again, you've got, you've got that reach to be able to get out knowledge. You might have an interest, you might have an idea in your mind that you haven't yet developed. Who knows? The, you know, there might be future Nobel Peace Prize winners, I don't know what, sitting in this room. So all of that, though, begins from an individual. So when we talk about how do you change the world, it's about thinking about what you want to do and your vision of leaving a legacy, like doing something that matters in the world, that makes a change, that makes a difference to people's lives, whether that's internationally, in your community, locality. And if you're sitting here thinking, that's a crazy title, like, how can this girl answer the question how you can change the world? The world is so much smaller than you think. You might go back to your university or wh whatever and change something at your university. The university might decide to roll that out across the city. You're changing the city. If you're changing the city, you can change the country. And if you're changing the country, what makes you think that you can't actually change the world? So the world is made up of different networks and webs like that. So actually, you'll be mistaken if you think that you couldn't make a difference. So, um, could you stand up for one second, please? Yeah. What's your name? N oh, oh, I was. I meant this girl, but but you can both stand up. What's your name? Oh, what sorry? Hedgen. Hedgen. Hedgen and Asif. Okay, you can both stand up. Okay, right. And now, can everybody stand up for one second, please? You need to stretch out anyway. Go on. Just let it let it go like this. Okay. So when Hedgen and Asif stood up, right. I could have just carried on talking, right? The girl next to Asif would have been like, Asif, what are you doing? Sit back down. This is crazy, right? You never know, right? But really, I could have carried on talking. But when a room full of people, 80 people, however many people are here right now, stand up, that's something you can't ignore. So when you think about change, when you think about making a difference, build force behind your cause, because that's something you can't ignore. Thank you very much. Take a seat. There are examples. There's actually a quote that says, I'm a movement by myself, but I'm a force when we're together. Yes, one person has changed the world. In fact, the greatest changes in the world have been made by one young person, but one, by one person. But they're the innovators of it. They initiate it. But they have always needed force behind whatever they've driven forward, you know? So that's extremely important. I mean, the young people we've worked with have changed laws. They've changed countries. For example, just, just going by London, we're in London today. The reason that travel is free for 16 and under year olds is because our young people decided that they wanted to do something about it. The reason that sex and relationship education is compulsory in this country and the level of which has been much improved in schools is because our young people decided that they wanted to build force behind their cause and make a difference. And we live in a democratic country, and so the government couldn't ignore it. 23,000 young people stood up and said, we're behind this cause, and therefore, they were able to achieve it. So small actions times that by lots of people equals big change. Big change. It might be that as a result of this conference, something you hear today, you may have a conversation with someone at break time. You might say, you know what, what really struck me was this. Yeah, no, I totally agree. This is what I thought. You might share a reflection. You might think, you know what? Let's exchange details. Let's see what we can do about it. And you build for You go back to your university country, whatever. You go back to your workplace country, whatever. And you decide to do something. So small actions, times that by lots of people, equals big change. And that is so much easier to do today because of social media. I don't even know how people did things in the past. Seriously. Twitter, Facebook, I post one thing out today. 40,000 people saw it this morning. So it's incredible what you can do by just social media. That's already available. But Remember this, we see things differently. People are different. Who has seen these adverts, particularly if you came from another country in the airport? You've seen it? Put your hand up. Yeah. Uh, look, okay, a lot of people. Good. The HSBC adverts, okay? They put the same image with a different word in the middle. So is the laptop work and the baby's playtime? Or is the laptop playtime and the baby's just hard work? So we can see one thing and think very, very different things. People are different, but thank God we are different. You know, today we're talking about like cultural differences, immigration, all of these things, what we bring to the world. 
like, and one of the quotes on this is, we are each unique. It's our differences, far more than our sameness, that will in the end save humanity. I don't like it when people say we're the same. We're not the same. We're equal, but we're not the same, right? We're different. And the, the, better, the more we realize that and celebrate differences to allow ourselves to progress, the better it will be for the world. One size is never going to fit all. We work over 100 different countries delivering skills development training, empowering people, going and doing these sessions that we do. And I always say to people, people call me up and say, Melody, oh, can you send over your training programs? And I say to them, I don't have set training programs. One thing that I do in China, we're not going to do the same in Japan and like India and UK and US and Australia, whatever. You know, every country is different. Even communities within, if you know, like this, your own surroundings are different. So how can we, um, you know, have, have that kind of an attitude? So when you think about your cause, whatever it is in the future, now, remember that one size doesn't fit all. So people are different and how can we celebrate and embrace that and use that as a strength and a platform to go forward on instead of something that, that you know, it, it's not productive to think that we're all the same because, you know, it's a waste of time. But there's that element of fear with everything that we do. Who here, um, I'm, I'm a social entrepreneur, so I'm particularly interested and passionate about improving the economy, but doing so through people and improving communities. So is there anybody here who's, who, who, is, who is a social entrepreneur or who's interested in being a social entrepreneur? I'm just, this is for my own interest. Anybody? Yeah, a couple of people. Okay, yeah, a few people. Oh, Mr. Eigen, how, how nice to know. Brilliant. Well, f there's that fear element. If you're thinking about, I am going to do this, it might be a change of career. You might be sitting here right now because you're actually considering a change in career, whatever it is. You might be doing your PhD or doing a university degree, whatever, and you're thinking about, what am I going to do now? There is always a fear element even the, the, the best of them, like Barack Obama. You think when they told him, come and be the president of a leading nation in the world, and there's been all this hype about it, so many people believing in you, he was probably like, I'm not even gonna swear, but he was probably really nervous about coming into office and like thinking, what the hell? Like he probably had a moment where he looked in the mirror and thought, Barack, seriously, what's going on? I am going to do this, right? Sharpened his suit and went out there, put a smile on his face. It's all an act, right? You know, he's probably extremely nervous and scared. But that's fear is one of the most natural things. You know this. You're, you're all extremely successful people. You know this. It's a natural thing. I'm not even going to stand here as much as we empower people and say to you, don't be afraid. It's all, be afraid. Be afraid. But next time you think about should I or shouldn't I, don't let fear be the reason why you don't do something. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I, I love quotes. I take a lot of inspiration from them. Courage is not the absence of fear, but it's the realization that something else is more important. So be driven by that something else. Allow that something else to drive you and be the thing that really takes you forward. I mean, um, We've worked with, a, I, I, we've been honored to have worked with um, 12 Nobel Peace Prize winners. And one of those Nobel Peace Prize winners, um, Shirin Abadi. Shirin Abadi is an incredible woman. She is one of the first female judges in Iran. She fights for the rights of uh, human rights prisoners. An incredible woman, really, really an incredible woman. She's also an Iranian, so particularly interesting in terms of the, the context. She said this, okay, this is a real question now, okay? Imagine I'm gonna jump from here to like there, what would I need to do? It's a real question, just shout out. What would I do if I wanted to jump from here to wh where that gentleman's sitting? What's that? Yeah, definitely. Oh, that, that goes without, definitely without saying, I'd need to see where I'm going. Thank you for that. I'll come back to that point, actually. It's an important one. Yeah? That's it. Give me, give me five. I bet you guys don't do that here, but we are going to do that now. <laughs> exactly. Do you know what most people say? They say jump, okay? They say, you jump. And if they had said you jump, I bet many of you were thinking it, okay? If, you, if I had jumped from here, okay, I'm not even gonna break my neck trying this in heels, but imagine if I had jumped from here, right? There's only so far you can get if you jump from where you're standing. So what do you do if you wanna jump really far? You do what this gentleman has just said. You take a run up. And she said that the difficulties and challenges we face in life are these steps back 
that allow you to go even further than you would have done had you started from here. So well done to you. It's exactly that. And I think that that's a very, very inspirational way to look at things. So I am zooming through this because like, I want to give you enough time to have a bit of a dialogue, okay? So, so if you're thinking this girl is just throwing information out, then that's because I want to give you enough so that we can have enough to talk about. So whatever it is that you want to do, if you follow me on Facebook and Twitter already, you're going to know this, so I'm going to ask you. There's three cornerstones that we think really um, form the foundation of whatever it is that you want to achieve. Okay, obviously, specifically, if you wanted to set up a business, if you wanted to set up a social enterprise, an NGO, whatever it is, then there's specific things that you would need to do depending on your very specific goal, obviously. But generically, generally, the three cornerstones, what is the most important thing that comes first? What do you think is the number one thing on the three cornerstones for achieving your goal? Shout out. Someone's thinking it. It's always someone is thinking it. What do you think it is? Number one thing on the three cornerstones for achieving your goal. Planning. planning. Who's the planning? Okay. You have totally jumped two steps ahead. That's the number three thing. See that, that girl, she's totally thinking ahead. Okay, so if that's the number three things, there's two things before that yet. Yeah. That's it. That, that's your point, right? When I said, how do I jump from here to here, what did you say? See. You have to see. Uh, what's another word for seeing something? Vision. A vision, exactly. So together, it's a vision, okay? Before you can do anything. It's like a journey. Think of it like a journey. What do you need first? It's a destination, right? You can't just go out about your way. I mean, you, of course you can. I mean, you, you wander and you aimlessly and don't know where you're going, but a destination in a journey is a vision. That's where I'm going. You made that point. I was very interested. No one has ever said that before when I asked that question. So I thought you would get it straight away. Exactly. A vision is the number one thing. Okay? I have a picture to go with that. Bam. Do you like how it does all that? So you can tell I work with young people, right? So that's the first thing. So, what's, so if planning is the third thing, what's the middle thing? So if you, on your journey, you have the destination, the plan is the map. What's the vehicle? Did you say passion? Oh, wow. You and me, we're on totally on the same wavelength. Give me five. That's good. Exactly that. I've never had the, yeah, we are so on the same wavelength. I like that a lot. It's exactly that. It's passion. It's exactly, this is a matter of opinion, by the way. This is inspiring age of three cornerstones. But passion is the driver. It really, really is the driver. You know those moments when you just think, I cannot do this anymore? It's passion that will get you through. And you know what? The only antidote to fear is also passion. Finding something you're passionate about. And if you're sitting here and you do for a living what you love, your passion, you're very, very lucky. Very lucky. I wake up every day and I come and do something that I love with a passion. And I've been doing it since I was 13 years old. And I love it. And that, that is a real blessing, I think. If, and, find, and, when you, and if you're not doing what you love and what is your passion, truly your passion, then find it. And find it and make it your career. Because it's going to be worth it. Even if it takes you five, ten years, it will be worth it. So if vision is the destination and the journey... And passion is that vehicle that's going to get you there. And then what do you do? You take out a map, don't you? You take out a map to figure out how you're going to get there. And that's the plan. How are you going to do it? The questions like time. Do I need to go and research? Do I need to study it? Do I need to speak to X, Y, Z person? Do I need funding? Whatever it is. So vision, passion, plan. Those are the three cornerstones. Um, and finally, this is my last slide. Um, it's a little frog story. Has anybody heard of the little frog story? No? Okay. So a bucket... Lots of frogs, and they're all like, oh my God, how are we ever going to get out of this bucket? This bucket is way too high. Anybody heard it? Okay, no. So they're all like, how are we ever going to get out of here? Seriously, look how high it is. It's way too high. We're never going to get out of this bucket. Oh my God, what are we going to do? This little frog at the back, he like comes up, leaps up and jumps straight out of the bucket. How was he able to do it? He was deaf. <laughs> 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 
That's it. <laughs> so the point is this. You know when you have your plan, there's going to be people who tell you you can't do it. There's going to be people who tell you that it's stupid. And there's going to be people who tell you that you are not good enough to do it. There's always people like that, for whatever reason there are. And sometimes in life, you just need to be a deaf frog. You just need to not hear it. Just don't hear it. Just do what you need to do. You know, I'm always criticized that I don't listen enough. Like on The Apprentice, they said, I just don't listen. And it's totally true. And my family will vouch for the fact that I just do not listen. And I have to listen more. Listening is good to people who you trust and who love you and want the best for you. And I need to do more of that. But you know how they say, like, your, your weaknesses are also your strengths. Well, that's part of the reason I've been able to do what I've been doing. It's because the people who tell me nonsense, I just don't hear it. I literally don't even remember it. I just block it. It's like it didn't happen to me. You know, I'm just very, very focused on this is what I'm going to do. That's my, that's my destination, and that's what I'm going to do, and that's that. And if it goes wrong, I only have myself to blame. I'm accountable to me and the people who I work for. Well, our beneficiaries, the young people. I run the company. So be a deaf frog, and those are our... Um, the, uh, the underlying notions, and um, that was a nutshell from Inspiring Age International and what we do. Um, if you're on Twitter, find me on there, Melody underscore Hussaini. I, I love talking to people on Twitter. We're always, always on there. We post a lot of our work and opportunities and things you can connect with. If you're on Facebook, just search for Melody Hussaini, and then in brackets, The Apprentice. That's my email address. You can check out inspiringage.com. And you can also check out melodyhusseini.com. There's a lots of information there and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been a pleasure being here today and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so if anybody has any questions or comments, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, so people probably know me, but um, I'm Owen Pugh. I'm uh, doing a master's at Durham. Um, you said earlier about uh, how the you know, 23,000 youngsters my age probably mm -hmm. um, stood up and have managed to improve um, sexual education in this country. But um, is it not a bit strange that with this improvement, we've also seen a stark rise so that now we have the highest rate of teenage pregnancies mm -hmm. that this country's ever known? Um, how do you think we can best uh, resolve this growing social issue? Mm -hmm. Um, to be fair, though, that social issue has always been there. And actually, um, the response from the young people to improve SRE has been as a result of the social issue and not the other way around. So that's very important to note. Um, the UK has always had... I mean, we've got issues with underage drinking. We've got issues with too much drinking. We've got issues with um, our um, youth justice system. And we've also got issues with under uh, age, it's like teenage pregnancies, highest in Europe, so highest in the Western world, actually. So, a real big problems. And these are all things, in my personal view, that are cultural norms, as it were, the cultural um, uh, trends that have been existing for years and years and years and generations and generations. And it will take, just like my English teacher used to say, complex questions have complex answers. And it is, it's a complex issue that will have a complex solution. Um, but I think that it's, interest, it, it, it's very important to be proactive. I once sat on a Q&A panel, okay, this is a totally true story now, okay. I know that you've had MPs speaking to you this morning. Um, I sat on the Q&A panel and it was an audience with young people. We had a Labour Conservatory and the Labour, uh, Labour Conservatory and the Lib Dem representatives as well as the Mayor and then I was sitting there as uh, like a youth, youth sector expert. Young person asked a similar question to you, but about drinking, and said, there's this issue, how are we going to deal with it? And one of the MPs actually turned around and said, well, my mother held my hair as I throw up on a, on a weekend, and I hold my daughter's hair as they throw up on a weekend. And I was just like, no, 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 like, that is totally absurd. And there is almost this... Um, sometimes a not amongst everyone but generally almost like a cultural acceptance and that is why and i think it's very important to be proactive and think of solutions and i think that those solutions can come from young people themselves instead of always waiting for government you know i always say you know think of those solutions and those young people they decided sre is very important they sent out a petition 
got 23,000 responses, which is the higher number than even government has consulted on this issue. And so the government couldn't ignore it. They got a young person onto the committee to co-chair this government committee to implement the recommendations. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a long way to go, I think. You know, these are generations and generations, but we have to move in the right direction instead of putting years on the issue, you know? Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, just one point of clarity. I mean, you mentioned the uh, so-called riots that transpired in, in August. I think it's important to point out that those disturbances morphed out of the demonstration against the murder of Mark Dug Duggan by the police, which still hasn't been cleared up. I think that there are going to be people who are going to take advantage of people's righteous indignation about you know, years, if not centuries, of oppression. You know, there are social conditions which exist in this country and in the United States, throughout the New World, if you will, in Europe, all over the planet. Right now, we see uh, a resurgence of the demonstrations in Egypt, which are directly related to the policies that were uh, directed against them by the British government. You know, so um, the, only, the only point I want to make is, is that the problems that we face, all of us, those are the things that, that we have in common. We breathe the same air. We drink the same water. We must, you know, take uh, food to our to us to, to to sustain ourselves. There are many things that uh, bring us to, that put us on common ground. Yes, of course, we are all individuals, but to survive on this planet and to resolve our pro our problems, we have to seek that commonality. <coughs> oh, absolutely. I think you made two slightly different points. Um, I mean, with the with the first point. In relation to, I mean, what happened, absolutely, there's issues there, I mean, that, that I won't go into, but there's, there's different considerations, really. You're absolutely right. But something that, you know, I always say is that be proactive towards what's right. You know, we view things every day, we witness things every day, um, which might be wrong, and it's important to take a stand. You know, I don't, I would never say, you know, just close your eyes and it's all okay, but it's important to match your action and your reaction to what you want to achieve. So going around and, and you know, being unlawful is, not, is, is going to overshadow what was actually the issue. You know? So I think that that's, that's the point there. But you're right to raise the initial consideration in terms of what happened there, which is a whole other complicated uh, point. Uh, my interest is about how to build young people's aspirations now and take that forward and really give them better employment opportunities and skills development to be able to really pick themselves up dust off the mess and actually think, you know what, I'm going to be proactive and create something for myself. Um, your second point about commonality, oh, absolutely, of course, you would begin with commonality. And that's what actually combines everybody. The reason you're all in this room, you all came from different places, but the reason you're all here is because of a common interest. You know, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So you're absolutely right. That's a very interesting and important point to go on. However, it's also important to highlight differences amongst the things that combine us because the differences is what will take us to the next level you know, of thinking solutions that, that one size doesn't fit all. You know, we, we've, we've spent a lot of time at United Nations conferences for particularly on climate change at COPs and you, know, you see a lot of things there about very powerful nations you know, trying to say to very small islands this is what's going to happen and this is... It's not like, you know, and um, Sir Nick Stern, you know, he said that it's like going out for dinner and then asking for the person you invited to pay for the bill. And it's almost like what we're doing to the world, really. You know, We've had the dinner, and now we're asking for the guests to pay for the bill. Um, and, and I think that that's something to really think about. One size doesn't fit all. But, but you've raised very interesting points. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Any more? Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Patricia Sack, and I'm a professor uh, from the U.S., and you mentioned about inspiring youth. Um, many of the young people in the U.S., I'm sure you've heard about the Occupy 
movements that are going on um, in terms of aspirations. You know, I have students that are graduating from college mm. <clears throat> with uh, student loans. Um, there are no jobs. Mm. And um, just recently, images went around across the, the world mm -hmm. in California where there were students who were pepper sprayed mm -hmm. by the police. You have, um, you know, all of these issues going on. You made mention about being unlawful, but many of these people were peaceful demonstrators. Yeah, and if it were not it for the advent of technology, people wouldn't see how, um, you know, these people are actually being beaten by and brutalized in many instances. Mm -hmm. By, by the police, you know, and these are peaceful demonstrators who are pretty much saying enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And many of them were inspired by uprising in mm -hmm. Egypt and Tunisia. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think even in London, that's why, that's actually why we had that conference not in our name. Because the majority of young people said exactly what you said. They said, hold on a minute. First of all, it wasn't just adults. It wasn't just young people. There were adults as well. And suddenly, it's like young people are ruining the world. And the second of all, the majority of people were lawful and, you know, and, and are lawful, you know, who weren't even there and are doing fantastic things. And obviously, the media, they, you know, are, other than, rather than running a story of a young person who set up a business, is thriving, is doing well, he's come from nowhere and is now doing very well for himself or has changed something in a community, they run a story on, look at this person, they did, went and did this, you know, and are now in prison or whatever. And it's, it's the world we live in. Um, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, I'm, I totally agree with you there. Absolutely. And, you know, and it's important to have the right to be able to do so. If we are saying to people, these are your human rights, you can do this, you can stand up for your belief, and then let's respect that. Otherwise, you're in breach of a human right, you know, and, that, and that's that. But, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, we'll just take a couple more questions, if there are any. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hudson Lynn. I'm interested in like social enterprises, so I'm just wondering what kind of challenges that you met when you initiated Inspire and Engage, and what was the solution that you found? Yeah, thank you. I think that um, one of the challenges with, with the social enterprise is, it's particularly to the mainstream, like when I was on The Apprentice, people were like, hold on a minute, you make money out of working with young people, that is so wrong. It's like, oh, but it's okay to make money and ruin the world. That's right. Mm? That's interesting. So, so there is still a taboo with making money out of doing something good for the world. And why is that? Like, that is crazy. If you think about it for a second, we totally support people who are making money and, and running corporates and creating greed and all of these things, uh, you know, that, that we heard about. Um, so that's one of the things, is that challenging that taboo, but that won't be for much longer, really, I don't think. I think people are really realising um, the importance of, particularly in climate change, the environment, you know, the green economy, all of these different things. So it's definitely an uprise. So um, the other challenge would probably be um, having enough time. <laughs> to do everything, honestly, when you're passionate about it. You know, if you, if, we've all had jobs we don't like doing, probably. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. And when you finish work, you just want to go home, you lock it away, and you're just like, whatever. But when you love doing what you love, like, my laptop never closes. My phone is always in my hand. I always want to know the emails I receive, who's contacting us, what do they think, what are we doing, how can I help, you know. On my Facebook, I'm always interacting with people on Facebook, posting pictures, hearing what, today we're doing a topical Tuesday where we debate like a topic. And um, you know, people are like, Melody, is this really you? Because how do you have time to be on Facebook all the time? But I'm like, seriously. You know, so that's the thing, when you're passionate, you always wanna give, 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 you wanna be, you know. So that's a challenge. Having enough hours in the day to do everything is, is tough, but you, you just have to manage, you know. I think that lady in the back, she's had a hand up. For yes, OK, just one more then. Hi, um, I'm Tara. I'm a student from Germany. And I wanted to ask you um, how um, you have these programs, these camps you do. And um, where do you, like, where do they take place? Do you have, like, a center or do you go to schools? Or yeah, yeah, how does question. that take place? Yeah, I should so say this, like, in the beginning. Yeah. Um, well, basically, how we work is um, either in partnership or as like a consultancy model. So we work as per need and request. So people say to us, you know, Melody, 
we want you to come to this university to work with our young people. Can you tailor a session? And we come and deliver it. So we don't have sessions ourselves. So we don't hold conferences and say, can you come along to ours? You know, We don't have a pot of funding ourselves. That's not how we work. It's not to our agenda. We're there to provide a service for a need. So people say to us, you know, like Germany, we've worked in Germany before. Can you come and do this? Our clients have included... You name it, we've, it's really, really wide, from NGOs, from the United Nations, to Merrill Lynch, to Phillips, to corporates and beyond, in terms of helping them to engage with young people in the right way, their CSR, but also working with um, like universities, people that have networks of young people. Um, you know, so it might be youth organizations or, or whatever. Um, and we work with their young people, design something for them that is very tailored to their specific needs and, and, and the context, uh, and then we go and deliver it. You know, and then we can also work in partnerships. So people say to us, you know, um, let's let's join forces and apply for funding to deliver X, Y, Z. Or it might be they say that come here and we cover your time and you come and deliver. You know, so we work in lots of different ways. And I also do a lot of like charitable things for my own chosen, you know, things that I just do for time. Again, there's the time element of it. But yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Okay, thank you very much. So on behalf of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, we'd like to thank you very much for joining us today here. Um, yes, please join me with a close welcome. Thank you very much.